All right, good morning, everybody. I'm gonna be talking about non-traditional finance. I was excited to see with the participants, we have lenders that I'm defining as both traditional and non-traditional. So I hope to get some more questions and discussions. And please feel free to ask questions, raise your hand at any time throughout my talk. Um, a little bit more about who I am. I've only been here for three months. I was previously in New York State at Cornell. I work in a lot of different areas that are related to agricultural policy, one way or the other, farmland markets, crop insurance, farm labor, and some agricultural finance issues, including non-traditional finance. And over the next year, I'm gonna be working on developing a program that's more, more focused on Kansas issues, I'd say, or, or more regional issues. Um, my own background, very quickly, I have a lot of roots in Midwestern agriculture. I'm from central Illinois. My grandma's from Sabatha, so I have a lot of second cousins in Kansas. Um, I've also worked in a lot of different places and, and worked on topics that are very different from Midwestern agriculture. Um, but, but to move on quickly, first of all, I'd like to motivate why I started working on this topic of non-traditional finance. And the, the impetus for that and how I got started was a article that came out in the Wall Street Journal in 2017. It was called America's Farmers Turn to the Bank of John Deere. And I found it to be a little bit sensationalist. I'll show you a quote from it later, which might motivate that. And also that it didn't have great data. And so I'd been working with USDA Farm Survey data, so I thought I could bring something to it. And it also was really interesting because if I want to know how farm credit works or commercial banks work, community banks, farm, um, the Farm Service Agency, I can learn about that. There's a lot of different resources. There's no textbook for non-traditional finance, so lending that, that happens outside of that arena. So in, in learning about this and trying to get better data, um, there, there hasn't been a, again, there hasn't been a textbook. I've had to talk to a lot of people who use existing data. So, I, again, I really appreciate your feedback. If something I say is different from your experience, um, let's have a discussion about that. Um, so first of all, what, what do I mean by non-traditional finance? So what's, what's the definition of, of traditional? Um, and, and this is a term that's been, been used before in agriculture, which is why I was using it. The last article that, that came out on this, um, was in 1994, and they use the term non-traditional credit suppliers. Those are people who, whose primary contact with producers is for something other than providing credit. I've modified that defin definition a little bit. I'm interested in lending that's happening outside of a local lender branch where there's a local loan officer where you have a relationship. Um, for me, this is the majority kind of a majority model. Well, this is where the majority of ag financing happens. It's probably where the majority is going to come from in the future, but there's a lot more players than they used to be. It's pretty interesting. And I've divided it into three major categories. Um, one is what I call this high value model. It's a Robo bank and a lot of the life insurance companies. They're working with larger customers and my understanding is they offer competitive rates. I'll get into more detail in each category. Later on, there's the vendor finance category, and that is basically what it sounds like. And then collateral base. Um, and this is a relatively newer category, I would say. Um, Arm is here. Um, there's a lot of other, other groups in this, Pharma, Comterra, Agrofinancial, um, that they're really making lending decisions based, based on collateral as well as other factors. It's a different different process than, than a lot of banks and farm credit would go through. There's also other categories that I just want to bring up. You can't fit everything into a Venn diagram. Cooperative finance probably belongs in the vendor finance category, so I'm going to, going to move it there. There's public lenders like the Farm Service Agency. AgDirect is pretty interesting. This is a non-traditional product. Um, it's, it's for equipment financing, but it comes from farm credit from a traditional lender. You hear a lot of stories about farms that are using credit cards in some cases. And in the far corner, that's the best picture, the guy with dollar signs, that's the best picture that I could come up with for a rich uncle 
So there's always been lending from individuals. That might be the most traditional form of ag lending or, or lending in general. Um, so, so that's just something I wanted to, to remind people of. And when I've been studying non-traditional finance, there's two, two stories that have been coming up um, that, that I think are important to emphasize and really motivate the questions I'm asking. And the first one is evolving agricultural credit markets. What do I mean by this? I think a really simple way of selling or of, of explaining this point is that almost everybody that's selling something, any service provider in agriculture is selling credit too. So most, most of the suppliers are, and a lot of other groups too. There's a lot of competition right now, as well as segmentation, and lenders are differentiating themselves in, in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's convenience, other forms of service, you're bundling credit with other products, um, standards, you know, I've heard a lot about Dodd Frank, could be playing a role, bank regulation, um, source of collateral as well. And so, so from this, I have two questions. I characterize these by lender and producer. You could probably have both of them um, in either category, but first is who are the competitors? So who, who's in this space? Um, that, that's relevant for both lenders and producers, I suppose. And the second one is what's the cost? So, so what does this space look like? The second story, and this is I think something you hear more about in the media at least, is that it's about financial distress. And I put this second on purpose because I, I think the more interesting story is this sort of evolving credit markets with a lot of different competitors. And I, I think the story is important too, um, maybe more for, for foreign policy reasons. But I, um, under this, again, I, I put two quotes, and these are by agricultural economists that are a lot more famous than I am, and they're from the Wall Street Journal. So the first one is that. This is a financial bridge to struggling farmers. This was Dr. Dave. Everyone knows Dr. Dave, right? Um, but, but anyway, that's probably closer to where I see some of the lenders that are in the non-traditional finance space. Not everybody falls into it. Um, the second quote is a lot more, um, this, this is from Scott Irwin. It's a lot more sensationalist. It basically, it's, it's sort of describing it as a little bit more, more predatory. Um, and again, my personal opinion is with the first one, but this is what what some people are saying. And and from this sort of sort of this discussion, it does lead to the question: How much farm debt is out there? Is it all being captured by the USDA estimates or or for financial regulators? Some, um, some of these lenders are regulated differently, so not everything gets included in official estimates. And how much of this would be considered high risk? So how, how do you measure financial risk in the farm sector? But these are more, more farm policy questions again. So, so these are the four questions that I'm gonna go through in this talk. Um, so what are different business models? I'll try to get into more detail on that. What is the cost of non-traditional finance? How much of non-traditional finance is there? That's more of a guessing exercise at that point. And the last point is how risky is this? What do we know about that? So for each one, I'm gonna provide the available data and then sort of what I've gathered from, from talking to people and, and what other information is publicly available. So first of all, what are the business models? I'm gonna go through these the three categories, but first I think what I'm going to call Ag Lending 101, it provides a useful lens for thinking about how, what non-traditional lenders are doing. So a lot of this, I think, for this group, it's going to be um, preaching the choir a little bit. Um, first of all, there's information barriers in lending to agriculture. I think this is some, something, again, that you're all aware of. Um, we call it moral hazard. And in extreme cases, you hear when you hear of a a farm operation that had a lot of debt field growth, grew very rapidly, took on a lot of rent and ground, the bubble burst eventually. A lot of time those lenders they had, it would have been like a Wells Fargo, a large bank, or, or some type of, of financing company outside of agriculture. It wasn't the local farm credit branch because they knew better. So that's the extreme case, but I think it's, it's true across the board. 
The next, you have to be able to secure a collateral. And the other point is that the farm lending isn't easy money. Um, not that it's not a good business, but I don't think it's a very good get, um, get rich quick type of you know, scheme either. Um, you're facing the same risk as production agriculture. So it's, it's a challenging business. So, so how, are, how are different firms navigating this? Um, and thinking about the different costs that they're facing. So the first category I talked about was these high value branchless lenders. Again, this is mostly Robo Bank and the life insurance companies, Conterra also does this. Um, and with this business model, they're going to be focusing on large commercial farms. I don't know the specific cutoff. They probably all each have some, some idea of what large is, but I do know they're all focusing on large farms. And they're going to be offering very competitive rates, um, to the best of my understanding. They're also going to be trying to provide a lot of service. So whether that's in, in loan servicing or in provide, providing other information about the markets or benchmarking can happen. Um, a lot of these firms do have farm sector expertise. I know one of my friends at MetLife always gives me a hard time. He says, we've been in the business for 100 years. How can we, how can we be non-traditional? So I'm not defining it by age, I'm defining it by your business model. Um, there's other lenders there that are relatively young, um, at least in the U.S. So Katja is based in the U.S. So Robo is, is Dutch, but they haven't been in the U.S. For, for that long, relatively. The next category is vendor credit. Um, I think this is probably something <laughs> people are pretty familiar with. And there's a lot of different forms of this. There's trade credit, which um, sometimes you call this effective credit if it's just accounts receivable management, it could be more informal. Sometimes the supplier will have an in-house financing arm, so there's Nutrient Finance or CNH, and it could also be third party. So you could, you could go to Robo AgriFinance or, or Dear Financial to do it. My understanding is it often exists to support product sales. It is something that they, they really need to have there to keep customers. When I talk to credit managers, they say, we really prefer to do this through a third party lender. Um, despite the fact that they're paying a fee for it. So they, they think that's pretty valuable. In some cases, they have riskier customers who can't go to a DR Rocco, so they'll, they'll do it in-house. And really, this is seen as a cost of doing business in a competitive ag retail market. For these um, third-party vendors, my understanding is a loan is actually guaranteed by the supplier. And what I heard anecdotally is that repayment is pretty high because of the supplier relationship. Um, another point of this is that the loan size is relatively small for most um, loans that are done through lenders. So that allows for an easier application process. I think if they do have larger loans, they're gonna, there's going to be more scrutiny. My understanding is the rates are also com quite competitive to low. And, and this can get absorbed in one of two ways. Um, it might be just a cost of doing business or it might end up in the product prices. And I'll talk a little bit more about that piece of it later. The, the next one is a collateral-based lenders category. This is probably really the, the newest category, I would say. Um, the first point I wanna make is they seem to have a lot of farm expertise. If nothing else, and most of their employees seem to have a background in ag lending or or other service providers. Um, I would say the lending decision is probably somewhat narrow where it's gonna be based on the collateral for whatever they're lending for and, and their repayment ability for that. I mean, Farm provided a nice example of how they do that earlier. The race, um, again, this is not public information, but my understanding is they're gonna be competitive to relatively high and that's gonna be based on the, the riskiness of a loan and there are, are different approaches for this or different markets. The first one is the term alternative lending gets thrown a lot, um, thrown around a lot. And, and the, whatever the definition is, these are farms that might have more difficulty accessing traditional finance. They're gonna have more difficulty working with a farm credit or bank branch. And in these cases, what I've seen is there's gonna be more rigorous oversight of risk management and collateral. And there is going to be a higher interest rate that reflect, reflects that higher risk. 
Um, there's also this term unconventional farms. So farms that have a different business model, um, maybe it may be easier for them to work with a collateral based lender. This is something that again, is kind of what feedback I've gotten as opposed to something that they could actually be measured. They may be willing to work with more leverage or more risk, risk top an operation. So if an operation wants to have a more aggressive strategy, they, it may be, they may be working with collateral based lenders. Um, another business model, this is what a farm, farm up does, they do operating credit and their, their business models, we're going to be, we're going to give you enough money to get you through, um, the season. So if your operating loan isn't going all the way and you have to move to vendor finance later on, we'll give you enough to get through all of that um, with a single lender throughout the season and the interest rate is going to be, be somewhere in between um, the, two, the effective interest rate. Um, so, so the next question I have, <coughs> how much does non-traditional finance cost? Well, first of all, because I've defined this rather broadly, it really varies on the lender type. It could be higher or lower. It's a difficult question to answer precisely because interest rates are confidential and you're not always going to be able to compare apples to apples. Um, and it, it could also be reflected in, in product prices too. So with all those caveats, what do we know? Um, so some of the research I've done is with USDA farm survey data on implement dealer financing. Um, so I, I worked for the USDA for three years before I was at Cornell with some of the farm income forecasts and the farm survey data, so I know it pretty well. And all of the information should be there on the different types of finance, but the one that the farm surveys really pick up best is implement dealers, and we can get information on both the interest rates and the loan value. So this table is a little bit too busy, but I'm going to talk you through the main points I have here. First of all, commercial farms. So you see the large million dollar farms category. That is USDA language, not mine. Um, but they're reporting that they get better rates in general. So if you look at the low sales category, um, you know, 4%, um, close to 5% at that time, where it's below farm below 4% for the larger farm. So um, they're able to, to negotiate better interest rates due to their larger size or other factors, which I don't, I don't think is terribly surprising. But for implement dealer financing, the spread is much smaller um, for, for, for these smaller farms. So the difference in the interest rate um, they get from implement dealers is much more competitive for these low sales farms. You can see that, that circle in blue. And for the larger farms, there's not much of a difference. They're getting basically the same interest rate from the traditional lenders and their implement dealers. And if you move down to this loan size category, you can see they have a larger loan balance with their traditional lenders. Um, so, you know, in, in some cases, non-traditional finance may be more advantageous for smaller or mid-sized farms which wasn't necessarily what we were expecting getting into this. And this is data from 2012 to 2016. Um, and again, it's for long-term non-real estate lending, which is more or less equipment lending. Um, the next part of this in terms of the cost is that it could come with your, if you're doing vendor credit in the financing, it could come with higher effective input costs. And I think this is not a great secret to a lot of farm managers. A lot of people have told me, yeah, we've been prepaying our inputs for a long time, but what's the actual benefit of that? Um, like interest, interest rates, input costs are, are um, largely confidential information. It's hard to compare. We're not at the end. So what can you do? And the one way that we found to look at this was by seed corn discount. So a lot of companies are going to hold their base price. That's going to be a little bit hard to figure out, but they have all their catalogs with their discount schedules. And it's different for whether you're using financing or not. And so you can compare those and look at the, the relative cost of, of buying your seed, seed corn with or without financing. And that, that was pretty interesting. Um, 
And so what we found, perhaps not surprisingly, is traditionally financed cash price is almost always going to be lower than the effective vendor finance price. And that's because your, um, your early pay discount is going to be lower. And in most cases, unless you have a really, really generous promotional rate, it's still going to be more expensive than traditional financing. Um, and so this is a chart we used to illustrate this. Um, what's the cost of seed corn with and without financing? Um, so that dark line up there is the base price, the, the straight dotted line on the bottom. That's the early ca pay cash price. And that's just taking into account the early pay discount and the value discount. I know there's a variety of other discounts, but these were the only ones that we could find that were consistently measured. Let's see if I can't move over here a little bit. Um, yeah, there's a base price, and this is the early cash pay price. And the bottom is savings of about $20 per acre um, if you do it that way. If you're going to finance it using traditional financing, so that's looking at a rate around prime, your cost is going to be down here. So it's sort of lower across the board. Um, if you have a higher effective price, again, that's due to the lower discount if you're financing. Um, and that's whether you're using early financing with prime or early financing with prime minus 2%. It's more of a promotional rate. So even with a pretty generous promotional rate, it's still going to, oh dear, Oops. what did I do? Am I okay on Zoom? Oh, good night. Okay. Uh, yes, you are. Okay. But I'm not sure what happened there. Oh, did I push the button? Is it plugged in? Yes, it was. Okay. There we go. All there right. It is. I'm not sure what happened. Sorry. Right. Um, and uh, I guess the other point I want to make is that. Uh, um, the cost is going to get higher later in the season. So, again, based on the sort of evidence we could find, um, pretty you get pretty substantial savings from early pay, even with traditional financing. Um, the next question I had is how much non-traditional financing is out there? Um, first of all, let's talk a little bit about what's driving the growth of non-traditional financing. Um, on the supply side, you have a lot of outside capital coming into agriculture. And really it's, you know, whether it's through land markets, through retail, or through credit markets. A lot of outside capital, um, there's a lot of interest in investing in agriculture, and it just continues to grow. Um, next is uh, there's a lot of innovation, I guess, another term to be good old-fashioned capitalism. So people are finding different ways to compete in this space. The next one is lending standards. Um, this again, I, I hear a lot from lenders about Dodd Frank, so this could be could be playing a role. Um, the last point is a lot of commercial bank, large commercial, the largest commercial banks seem to be pulling out of agriculture, and so there's been analysis from 2015 to 18 that shows this, and everything I've heard about the past six months is the same story. Um, the other factors is just the diversity of farm businesses, whether it's by size, complexity, do they want to grow fast? A lot of rented land, increased appetite for risk. So they're going to have different financing needs, financial stress. We talked about that earlier. Um, so how big is it? The short answer is, I think 20% is a pretty good guess. And you can get this by adding up the different categories. Um, we also measured this with, with KFMA data, so with Kansas Farm Survey data. And it was about 20% in 2012. So it might be higher in Kansas. It's also, it's also difficult to measure because you're re relying um, on sort of, sometimes it's not, not official data. So the people tell you about their lending value. For example, Rabobank, they're a private bank, so that's not going to be anywhere online. You can't get that data. But they had a news article where someone interviewed them and said, we have $15 billion of business. I talked to someone in Rabo, and he said, yes, that's right. So, that's the number I'm using for Bravo. Um, so if you do this, this, this high volume category, I think you can easily get to 10%. For vendor financing, I was doing something more than the 3% number, and I talked to people in industry, and they said, well, it's about a 10% of the, the input market is financed 
by vendors, and that gets you up to about 7% of farm loan value. So, so that might be a pretty high number, collateral-based, um, one to 2%. That number is a, really is just a guess. Um, it, it's hard to know because these institutions don't, don't report their lending value. Um, so how does this compare to farm credit or banks? They're in the 40% range in 2019, FSA is 3%. Now, if any of you have been doing the math, these percentages don't total to 100%. Um, and that's, again, because the official USDA estimates aren't always going to pick up lenders that don't publicly report their lending values. Um, so 20%, what about the size of individual lenders? How does that compare to, to traditional lenders? So the largest farm credit association had nearly $30 billion of loan value in 2019. MetLife had 21 billion. Not all of this is loans to production agriculture, but still it's a big portfolio. Rabo, 15 billion. That doesn't include their, their vendor finance arm. American added credit, almost 12 billion in 2019. Conterra, they're a, a, a lender out of Iowa. They have a $4 billion portfolio. Funding tier farm credit, two billion in 2019. John Deere Financial, three billion. Um, on the other hand, here's a specific number: the farm loan holdings of the largest 30 banks declined by 17 percent between 2015 and 2019, um, and that added up to 18 billion dollars in March of 2019. Um, the total farm sector debt estimate was for almost 400. $34 billion, and that's, that's the most recent one from August. Um, so what about locally? Um, if, if you look at these charts, this is Kansas data, it's a Kansas farm management data. Um, and this is really hard to see, right? Um, okay, so this dash gray line on the bottom, that, those are non-traditional lenders, and they've been about a third of all loan value. And this chart goes from, 2000 to 2012. Up here, the, the blue line is farm credit and the orange line is commercial bank. Um, and that's the share of all loans. So again, I talked earlier about how a lot of the vendor finance is relatively smaller loans. So they might be a third of credit, but they, they're only about 20% of the total market share. So that reflects the smaller loans for farm credit. That's the blue line, it's the opposite. Um, so relatively smaller share of loans, but a larger share of loan value. And I think what, what you see with commercial banks here, and that's, that's going down, that probably reflects broader national trends. Farm credit's picking up some of that, and non-traditional lenders are picking up some of that as well. And so now I'm going to present some New York farm, um, data. And th this is based on research I did with a graduate student when I was at Cornell. Um, we were trying, trying to think broadly, how are we going to research non-traditional finance in the Northeast? And everybody we talked to said, well, feed manufacturers are, you know, they do a lot of, of lending or effective lending. Um, we worked with the industry. We got 70% of the industry in terms of volume to share their accounts receivable data with us, um, which was a lot of work and a lot of trust building. And what that allowed us to do is to establish that feed manufacturers are the largest lender um, other than farm credit in the Northeast. They're larger than any commercial <coughs> bank in, in terms of loan value. And this is something they have done historically I'll answer that a little bit later, um, but it also, in, in terms of their loan volume, it went up a lot from 2014 to 18, when milk prices were low, sort of an extended downturn. Um, another way to look at it is they held 16% of all credit um, for dairy farms in 2018. So in that case, that they are a major player in financing agriculture, a lot of them didn't really, was still trying to figure out what they wanted to do with it and didn't necessarily want to be in that space. Um, 
So what about nationally? This is based on the USDA farm survey data that I talked about earlier. Again, we're focusing on implement dealers. Um, so the implement dealers, that's that's the, the orange category, and that goes through 2016. Um, and you get about 30% during this period. The yellow is traditional lenders. Um, and so the trend here is nice. It sort of shows the growth over the past two decades in lending from implement dealers. I do think that one third is probably an underestimate from everything I hear they're closer to 50% today. Is that anybody 50%? Sound reasonable? Must not be terrible. You tell me, right? Um, the next question I have is how risky is non traditional finance? Um, so, so, what's the riskiness of debt that's held, held by the firms operating in this space? Um, first of all, a study that, that was done in Kansas, and this was done by other, other researchers here at Kansas State. And they had some interesting findings in this respect. The farms using non-traditional lenders were younger. They had more equipment and less land. So you know, for farms that are doing a lot of renting, this is an important source of credit. Um, and for farms that use both non-traditional and traditional lenders, they did tend to be more leveraged. And, and really the conclusion of this study is if the farm economy declines, more leveraged farms are likely to add on a second or third lender. So that again this is a sort of financial grid story for, for non-traditional finance this supports and we also saw something similar in new york state again going back to the dairy farms example we're looking at accounts payable um, and so this goes from 1993 to 2018 the blue line is change in accounts payable and the red line is milk production the milk feed margin um, and the what you see here is they're always moving in opposite directions of a similar magnitude. So when margins go down, your accounts payable are shooting up. And feed is the, by far the largest expense for dairy farms. So um, here you see non-traditional finance is a very large counter cyclical role. It's again, it's that financial bridge story. And, and for the dairy industry, the North East is playing a pretty important role. Um, we tried to dig at this last point we tried to dig into who are the producers um, that are really relying on accounts payable when their margins are going down. Um, these were more leveraged farms. We tried to look at them historically because again, they went back to 1993. And it did look like historically that higher levels of rent and land. So really they're trying to use leverage to grow their operations and, and remain competitive during this period. I do want to say, though, that it's important to say it's not always related to financial status. Now I'm going to switch to USDA farm survey data. So this is implement dealer financing at the national level. And what we did here is we looked at farms that were financing with an implement dealer, and we looked at farms that were financing with traditional lenders. And then we looked at different measures of their financial status, solvency, liquidity, profitability, and repayment capacity. And for everyone we looked at, they were almost the same. We also did a regression analysis. So this finding holds up if you control for farm size, where they are in the country, what they're producing, anything that we can observe. Uh, so if you, if you look at the data, you could not see anything in the data that explains um, any, any relationship between financial status and whether or not you're using an implement dealer or traditional financing. Um, so I have had a lot of conversations with non-traditional lenders, um, just sort of how is business going? There's a lot of lender surveys out there. We have one in Kansas State, the Fed does it. Um, and I think probably a lot of the things I've heard are similar to what traditional lenders are saying. Margins are low, it's challenging, government payments are important. I heard the term ones haven't seen anything like it, um, but it could be accelerating existing lending. Um, but I also did get the impression that business is growing for a lot of non-traditional lenders. Um, to the degree that this is different than what's happening in traditional lending is hard to say, but I, you know, I heard about, you know, there's demand for refinancing, we're able to offer greater flexibility, big banks are getting out. Um, 
some indications that some firms in this space are hiring. There's new entrants. There's a firm called Greensill from Australia that does vendor finance. I've been trying to talk to them um, and um, have not yet, but, but that's a pretty big firm in Australia that's backed by venture capital. So it'll be interesting to see, see what they do. And it is also, you know, we, we were able to adapt pretty quickly to a remote work and, and learning environment. Um, so, so what are the takeaways? Um, sort of in, in the non-traditional lending space. First of all, I think this is creating additional value in risk in agricultural credit markets. Um, the, the fact that the lenders increase the supply of credit, especially during downturns, um, more lending, more risk. Um, so I think that's pretty straightforward. I think they may compete with traditional lenders in some cases. In other cases, I do hear about a lot of cooperation that is complementary. Um, I would say it makes farm management, it's definitely farm lending more interesting. There's so many players in the space and a lot of competition. Um, in a lot of cases, especially for vendor credit, it's not really about providing credit, it's about market share. So I think, you know, lenders are competing um, with firms who are actually not trying to, to make their money off of lending. So that's a challenge. From a farm policy perspective, it does make tracking financial stress or the value of farm lending much more challenging. So this is an area that I plan to continue to work on. Um, one thing I'm going to be doing is really digging into UCC filings, um, so liens on farm equipment to try to get a better idea of equipment lending trends. Um, so this is both, does this match official data? How much is official data off? But also, where is non-traditional finance happening? Where, you know, where are the implementing groups or other groups gaining market share? And you know, is this linked to stress? Is this linked to weather shocks, higher rental rates? So trying to understand that. There's more analysis we can do with the KFMA data. So some of the questions I asked about the value of lending or what type of lenders are using non-traditional finance. We're working to do some more analysis and, and bring that analysis up to more, more recent years. We're also sponsoring, um, we got funding from the USDA to do a special issue of our, our um, journal, Agricultural Finance Review. Um, so trying to get people across the country to take whatever regional data or, or sort of relationships with industry that they have to add better data to this analysis. Um, some other things I'm thinking about um, first is secondary debt markets in agriculture. How big is it? Um, I'm not sure, but but you do. You, I've been hearing more about this, so this is something we can measure or try to understand better. Um, the next question is: There are lender surveys out there, so why couldn't non-traditional lenders do this? Whether it's vendors or other groups. Um, so um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, any questions about anything I talked about, um, or just does this? Um, what I'm presenting and how I'm characterizing it doesn't match with your experiences. Go ahead. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> so all consistent? Made sense? Did the market share numbers make sense? You go back to that one. <laughs> This is not working. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, the market share numbers. Jenny, I've got a question here. Page 11, what is the difference between share of loans and share of loan volume? Yeah, so, so the share of loans would be the, the number of loans. So you have 10 loans, you could have four with non-traditional lenders and you know, four with farm credit. Probably the farm credit ones are bigger, and the volume is the actual dollar amount. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Folks from ARM, do you guys have any questions? If I said anything wrong, I talked to Billy Moore a couple months ago. So you can blame him. Good? All right. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. That's super helpful. 
Do you think you're bigger than your competitors or, or similar? Okay. Could you just give a summary of that for the online folks? I didn't catch it. Okay, so so the folks folks from ARM said they think they're gonna do about eight hundred fifty million dollars of business in twenty twenty. And they think they're probably bigger than most of their competitors. 